This episode of Fine Scale Modeler's new product rundown features Edward Zero, Tacom's M114, MPC's Hawk Fighter, Hobby Boss's U2, Ravel's Space Shuttle, and Tacom and Snowman's USS Sprank Knox. New product rundown brought to you by Hobby Zone USA, your source for hobby storage solutions, hard to find hobby tools, and aftermarket modeling needs. And by Cult TV Man's Hobby Shop, the place to go for science fiction and fantasy kits, details, masks, decals, and more. Welcome to New Product Rundown, Fine Scale Modeler's monthly look at the latest releases. I'm Aaron Skinner. And I'm Tim Kidwell. We have a packed show for you today. Some people might even call it crunchy. Really? Crunchy. We're going with crunchy. Okay. I'm going with crunchy. Fair enough. So let's get rolling, or in the air, as it were, with Edward's new 148 scale, Zero. This initial release marked Tora Tora Tora, and to correspond with the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, includes two complete zeros. Typical of Edward's recent releases, surface detail includes incredibly fine recessed panel lines and rivets, with a few raised fasteners, notably around the fairings at the tailplane roots. The wings comprise a full span lower with part of the plane's belly and separate upper halves. The ailerons are separate, and unused optional parts with trim tabs indicate other versions of the Japanese fighter are inbound. There are also unused lower wing inserts for other armament versions than used here. The elevators and rudder are also separate. Up front is a detailed engine with two banks of cylinders with valve pushrod covers, reduction gear housing, and ignition ring. It fits inside a multi-part cowl with separate intake underneath and top with gun channels, and a one-piece front ring. Edward supplies a jig to align all of it. A three-blade prop and spinner finish the power plant. Cockpit details include a floor, rear frame, to which the seat is mounted, sides with molded controls and consoles, instrument panel, controls, and frame for the cowl machine guns. Detailed gear bays support nicely molded gear legs with thin doors and wheels with separate hubs. The clear parts have well-defined frames and offer optional sliding sections to pose open or closed. Pre-cut masks will help with painting. Pre-painted photo etched metal supplies instrument panels, seat belts, cockpit controls, and landing gear details. The decals provide markings for 12 A6M2s, all involved in the December 7 attack. And the notes indicate which wave they were involved in. All the zeros are in early Japanese naval scheme of overall gray-green with blue-black cowls. This looks like another outstanding 148 scale kit from Edward. I expect we'll see a lot of them built up in the near future. Next up is a subject that has shown up a lot on most wanted kit lists, an M114. This one's from Tacom. Smaller than the M113 armored personnel carrier, the M114 was designed as a command and reconnaissance carrier. This 135th scale kit represents the A1 variant with a cupola mount of machine gun that could be fired from within the vehicle. Sad to say, it proved to be underpowered and mechanically unreliable when deployed to Vietnam, and while it remained in service in the U.S. Army in the U.S., Europe, and Korea, it was finally withdrawn from service in 1979. The hull builds from a belly, sides, rear panel with separate troop hatch, roof with hatches and commander's cupola, glasses with engine hatch and fording plate, and the top engine grills. The suspension comprises road wheel arms and shock absorbers. The road wheels feature separate rims and tires for the outer wheels. Drive sprockets and idlers finish the running gear, which gets wrapped in well-molded link and length tracks. Jigs help align the links. Although all the hatches are separate, there isn't a ton of interior detail beyond some stuff molded on the walls and engine compartment bulkheads. Armament includes the remotely operated 50 caliber machine gun for the commander's cupola and an M60 that mounts on the roof near the troop hatch. Clear plastic supplies light lenses, periscopes, and vision blocks for the cupola. Photo etched brass is used for engine screens and gun details. The decals provide markings for four M114s, all in olive drab. Many wear bold numbers and symbols. Given that the vehicle is relatively small, it looks like it'll be a straightforward build with what's in the box. It'll look really neat on a diorama, say for an exercise in the United States or Europe. MPC has released a new, larger 
Hawk Mark 9 from Space 1999. Now, I've wandered into the minefield of scales of Space 1999 ships before, but round two is reporting this to be 148 scale. Suffice it to say, it's in constant scale with the Eagle transporter. The main fuselage has sharply molded surface detail, including panels and textures. It's clear enough that you can recognize the sources of Greeblies, such as this lunar module. The boosters at the rear and the main engine that mounts on the rear bulkhead all have finely molded engine bells and supports. Other features include pylons, weapons, landing thrusters, typical Space 1999 lattice supports, and more. Clear plastic provides the windscreens, but no cockpit detail is included. A domed plastic stand with metal rods supports the finished model. The decal sheet supplies stencils and panels for much of the ship, so you should only need to paint the orange and white parts of the scheme. MPC has produced the Eagle Transporter and the Hawk, now both in 172nd scale and 148th scale. So, if you wanted to, you could build both of them in two different scales. Or pick the scale you prefer or you have shelf space for. That makes sense. Here's a new tool, 172nd scale U2A from Hobby Boss. Designed to have a super high flight ceiling, 70,000 feet, right at the edge of space. It was meant to be able to be out of the range of fighters, out of the range of missiles. I can go on and on about it. I've just got a thing for spy planes. Needless to say, it's another beautiful Lockheed Skunk Works design. Right? It really is. Surface detail on airframe parts, such as the fuselage, is fine recessed panel lines. The wings show similar detail, and the trailing edge flaps and ailerons are molded with the upper halves with fine edges. The horizontal stabilizers are molded together, and the two-piece vertical tail mounts on it. Each intake is a single piece, and at the other end is a two-part jet pipe with engine details. For the cockpit, the kit supplies a tub, seven-part ejection seat, instrument panel, and controls. The landing gear and speed brake bays have detail molded in their inserts. The legs and wheels for the tandem gear look good, and the wispy outrigger gear looks suitably fine. Clear plastic supplies the two-part canopy and sensors. Decals give markings for two U-2s, including one that is now on display as a U-2C at the Strategic Air Command Museum outside of Omaha, in two different markings, and a very plain aircraft in NACA livery. This looks really nice inside the box, and I think it'll look even better when it's, once it's built, and it would look really cool with the high-vis Air Force markings. To mark the 40th anniversary of the Space Shuttle's first flight in 1981, Ravel has reissued its 172nd scale kit of the orbiter. This kit actually started life in 1979, which was before that first mission. Now, for me, the space program has always been the space shuttle. I was a little too young to remember the moon landings, but the shuttle came about just as I was getting interested in the space program, and so I was fascinated by it. This vehicle that could be reused, carried all kinds of stuff into space, helped build the space station, the International Space Station. Just a cool vehicle. Absolutely. Typical of a kit of this vintage, the parts feature raised lines. Much of that here representing thermal tiles. Although there are some panels as well. The cockpit is relatively simple with a floor and four seats, an instrument panel, and overhead console. The payload bay includes a floor, rear, and front bulkheads with European Space Agency Space Lab and other mission pallets as well as the remote manipulator arm. The outer doors and inner radiator panels are hinged to be movable. The landing gear is suitably sturdy and the wheels are molded in halves. Also molded in halves are the main engine bells, which attach to the rear plate and multiple parts go into the orbital maneuvering system pods. Clear plastic is used for the windshield, other cabin windows and a skylight in the space lab. The big, beautiful decal sheet gives markings for four of the five shuttles. Columbia, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavour. All feature the so-called Meatball logo for NASA, so are appropriate for missions after the late 1990s. Each vehicle differed slightly, and all of them changed patterns of thermal protection over the years, so check references, including the Haynes Owner's Workshop Manual, which you can pick up at combathobbystore.com. It's also available at myscienceshop.com, that also carries this great worm logo mug. They have the meatball logo if you prefer that one. I like this one myself. It's a good looking mug. 
Finally, we have this ship kit from Tacom and Snowman, the 1700 scale, gearing class destroyer, the USS Frank Knox. Now these two companies have partnered for this release, which also features the Charleston Navy Yard number no. one dry dock for a bit of a different display. The hull, which is about six and a half inches long, has separate parts above and below the waterline. And the deck features fine fixtures. Shafts, screws, and rudders finish the propulsion system. The major superstructure is a single piece with hatches and plumbing molded on. Atop that sits another section with the bridge, gun tubs, and a pair of smokestacks. Armament includes three five-inch turrets, torpedo tubes, and several anti-aircraft guns. No railings are given, but a small photo etched metal fret supplies ladders, stairs, and some structural supports. Decals give walkways and markings for two gearing class destroyers, USS Frank Knox in November 1944 and USS Sutherland in March 1945. The dry dock comprises a floor and sides with molded brick texture, a section of dock alongside, and the gate. Other details include stairs, support blocks, pumps and plumbing, and a crane. Much of the photo etched metal in the kit details the crane and pumps. I like the cut of this kit's jib with a few figures and a nice bit of repaint or repair going on. It could make a really nice diorama. It could. So we had another gearing class destroyer from Tacom Snowman that we sent out for review. So look for that review on finescale.com along with reviews of the U2, the Hawk, the Edward Zero, am I missing? Oh, the and the M114 as well. Right. You can also find a ton of great videos and how-to information there. I'm Tim Kidwell. Thanks for watching. I'm Aaron Skinner. We'll see you next month. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <clears throat> Look, it's nine in the morning, and you know what? It's martini time. I, uh, I wasn't alive for the morning landing. Inappropriately, <laughs> I was in utero for the first time. <laughs> I heard it on the radio, supposedly. I was like, wow, we're out. I'm like, I'm going to go home. <laughs>